So it seems pretty clear that the zombie apocalypse is already upon us. And we got folks running into things and falling off cliffs. And we even got baby zombies. Zombies eating in restaurants and standing in line. So I want to take a look at this book here, which I heard about from McMahon's channel. This is a guy who has a channel just talking about how he is addicted to wristwatch collecting. Facebook, I was on there for a while, but then like a coworker's wife just kept posting all this Twitter, I just could never figure out Twitter, so I just barely post anything on Twitter or Instagram. So I went ahead and did that. I killed all my social media accounts and started exercising and taking cold showers and also stopped masturbating. Right. I worship this writer named John Hawks and this book here, best thing I've read so far this year. And one thing I like to do is to see how his dark light refracts through some of his past students like Eugenides or Rick Moody or Joanna Scott especially. And I thought it'd be interesting to take a look at this book here, which seems YA at first. This was put out by Knopf in 2017. Uh, because this author had also gone to Brown and always says here that he won the John Hawkes Prize in Fiction, but also that this book has gotten such a low rating on Goodreads that it could only be a good thing that he maybe was pushing it so far experimentally and I just wanted to investigate. I believe he also took classes with Robert Coover and but despite all that, somewhere along the way he became my mortal enemy. It's like his actual writing is real similar to the protagonist here, Gork. He's a sensitive, puny, poetic dragon who's nicknamed Weak Sauce and whose quest, despite having these really tiny horns, is to mate with a thick-ass girl dragon. We got dragons here trying to rip each other's heads off in this Harry Potter-like academy called War Wings, and flying spaceships to colonize other planets alongside robot dragons. And it's easy to identify with Gork as the underdog because just the fact that we're reading this book already, as readers, puts us in a world of alienation, but what if the act of reading or becoming a reader is forced upon you, like at an early age where you have a father that just rains down literature upon your head as you're trying to go to bed at night, growing up in a house without any screens or television, being forced to play your musical instrument two hours a day, rebelling against your white middle-class family by enrolling in the Marines, perfect breeding grounds for burying yourself with the cannibal by your side, to create this monumental work that you wouldn't mind jumping off of because your memory would blossom under its shadow. And one day you go and check the mailbox and this is a couple months before True Tragedy and this is the debut fiction issue of The New Yorker. You can see that your arch enemy has already made it to New York. Then you get more salt in the wound the next year. This story collection comes out, his first dealing with the Gulf War and how the Gulf War syndrome has affected some of the veterans and he actually didn't go to war but he you know got a lot of these stories secondhand during his time in the military very similar to this book here the, these two pair really well follow this tradition of short story collections dealing with war topics he was doing pretty good for himself at this point he was at princeton teaching alongside joyce carol oates and tony morrison and, but then he got lost in asia for a while he settled in seoul and figured he was working on his first book um, kind of got hooked up with this one dude. God damn it. Alright, I've been looking forward to this. Hey, hey here he is. I'm Chang Ray Lee. Chang Ray Lee. Come on in. The result of which here would make a 10 year old slap his head off his face. I mean, like the science fiction fantasy elements are cranked up to such cartoonish levels. I mean, you can still appreciate this book. You just have to come at it from a more ass backwards um, direction. Taking this bleeding heart out and smearing it in your face uh, is sort of correction to that sincere wave that was itself a correction against the irony of the 90s, which I always thought that he was just trolling. There's a certain power in all that. Because you you have also the ability to like access stuff that most people don't or can't, or because of your sincerity, you'll just cross the line and say the true thing, as uh, Mr. Valente was saying, and it's very funny. So I would just like keep speaking your truth, and then you'll just kind of back everybody else up against the wall. Most people do not want to tell the truth. Now his voice, I think, is recognizable at this point as being unique, but. You know, it might one day become something like a, a Richard Brodigan or Nathaniel West. You can see how it would pair pretty well, especially against um, 
stories that have a lot of tragedy in them, kind of like what Kurt Vonnegut does. Then you begin to understand how much pain this dude actually did suffer despite winning all these awards. He really was this pale, depressed, lanky kid with his hot girl hanging off his arm when he got up off the couch to pick up that first prize award, looking like it was a complete tragedy while you were just happy to be in the room picking up sloppy seconds. So when you tell me that your life fell apart because of him, even though I know that's total bullshit, I'll still tell you that you didn't waste half your life pursuing the same dream, that you still got time, you still got talent, you just have to have faith. Even though I know it's fucking too late.